If you don't understand covenant, you don't understand the mind of God. In the covenant, there is no doubt. That means there is no doubt in your life. Don't define your life by what you are going through. Define your life by the covenant. You must believe in it. I want to thank you for stopping by to watch this YouTube sermon. I believe your life will be deeply impacted by the truths that are in this message. Remember, the Word of God is like seed which God gives to us. Seed from heaven which brings God's life, power and wisdom. And as you receive these truths into your heart, it has the power to transform your life completely. Can you also do a favor for us? Can you please like this video and send the link to a friend whom you know will be blessed through this. And if you are not a subscriber yet, would you please subscribe to this channel so that we can reach more people. God bless you as you watch this message. This message is going to revolutionize your life. Covenant faith. Now, let me ask you a question. If I asked you to give me five top words in your heart and mind that define Christianity. When you think of Christianity, what are the top five words that come to your mind? What would they be? Jesus, right? Church, missions, the Bible. Those may be the most common words that will come to the top of your mind. Okay? Now, what about this word, covenant? In my guess, not a single one of you here in this room thought about this word when you thought about Christianity. Because this is not very commonly used. It is not commonly expressed today in our forms of Christianity. But what if I told you that if you do not understand this word, you do not understand Christianity. And if you don't understand this word, you do not understand the gospel. And if you do not understand this word, you don't really understand the sincerity and the seriousness of God for our benefit and for our lives. So, the Lord has been speaking to me about taking the faith of the church deeper. The root of our faith must go into deeper foundation, into more than this thought. Our faith is based on the Word and on the Bible. That's wonderful and that's true. But it must go deeper than our understanding of just the Word. The faith that we have must go beyond simply what we experience in a day-to-day -day life. It must go beyond our understanding of the Word in the Bible sense. And it must be rooted from this source called covenant. Genesis chapter 21 verse 22. And it came to pass at that time that Abimelech and Pichol, the commander of his army, spoke to Abraham saying, God is with you in all that you do. The world needs to witness that God is with us as Christians. And here Abimelech, a heathen king who is not aware of spiritual things, sees Abraham's life and he senses that there is something upon Abraham that we don't have. That is called the witness of the Spirit. Verse 23, Now therefore swear to me by God that you will not deal falsely with me, with my offspring or with my posterity, that according to the kindness that I have done to you, you will do to me and to the land in which you have dwelt. Then Abraham said, I will swear. Then Abraham rebuked Abimelech because of a well of water which Abimelech's servants had seized. And Abimelech said, I do not know who has done this thing. You did not tell me, nor had it I heard of it until today. So Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them to Abimelech, and the two of them made a covenant. So this is just one of the instances in the Bible where we see the word covenant. And you see them throughout the Bible. In fact, in the Old Testament, this word comes up around 250 plus times. So Abimelech and Abraham made a covenant. And Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock by themselves. Then Abimelech asked Abraham, what is the meaning of these seven ewe lambs which you have set by themselves? And he said, you will take these seven ewe lambs from my hand that they may be my witnesses that I have dug this well. So the lambs are the witness. Therefore he called that place Beersheba because the two of them swore an oath. Thus they made a covenant at Beersheba. So Abimelech rose with Pichol, the commander of his army, and they returned to the land of the Philistines. Then Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba and there called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. So Abraham and Isaac made a covenant. So the word here covenant, if you look at this story, simply means an agreement a treaty between two kings. Abraham was like a king, Abimelech was like a king. So they made 
a treaty. And that covenant included the children, it included the posterity, and also the land. Not only that, there were certain terms that were given to one another, that they would be kind to one another. And also understand that the dispute of the well was settled on the basis of this treaty and agreement, and there were gifts given to one another, which were a witness of the covenant, and a memorial was also planted, a tree which was like a sign to Abraham and Abimelech and also to all the people that these two powerful rulers are in a covenant, in an agreement with one another. So keep that in mind. The Hebrew word for covenant is the word berit. And the word berit simply means covenant. It means a treaty, an agreement, a contract between two parties. All right? Now the closest term to a covenant today in today's language would be a marriage and the word covenant you will find it used most often in marriage and not in day-to-day -day treaty with contracts agreements with banks partnerships no even in the church we rarely use this word but here the word berit means covenant and it comes from the root word brit which means to cut. So a covenant literally means to cut where it bleeds. It also means this, to make an agreement by cutting pieces of flesh and walking between them. So the rite of circumcision for a Hebrew boy is also called, even today, a brit or a berit, which means to cut, because a circumcision means to cut and blood flows. And that cutting and the blood flowing is a sign of the Hebrews' covenant with God. So when you talk about covenant, always keep in mind blood and the cutting. So that's what the word covenant means. Now this agreement can be made between two individuals. It can be made between two kings. It can be made between a king and his subjects. Or it can also be made between God and man. And throughout the Bible you see that. And this covenant is always accompanied with symbols or signs. That means there will be sacrifice of animals. There will be also a solemn binding of terms of the covenant that are given to one another. There will be a covenant meal, a memorial meal. There'll be a giving of gifts. You see that throughout the scripture when David and Jonathan entered into a covenant, Jonathan gave his belt to David. So that was the significance of that covenant agreement, okay? Setting up of a monument. It could be a tree, it could be stones. So all of these are signs of a covenant. Now, in ancient times, a covenant is the strongest and most solemn contract or treaty that can ever be signed between two individuals or nations, which means this, a covenant can never be broken. It is for life. So it's the strongest personal guarantee of personal loyalty or personal safety, which can never be broken. Today, a marriage vow is akin to a covenant. The concept of the covenant, where did it come from? Did it come from the Godfather, as in the movie Godfather? Did it come from Abraham and Abimelech? No. And this is where we must awaken to the truth of the Scriptures. Are you ready? The concept of covenant comes from God, not from man. It's a divine concept injected into human consciousness from God Himself. The idea of covenant comes from God. So unless we understand covenant, we cannot understand the mind of God. And you will escape a very important part of His essence and His nature. Throughout the scripture, if you will study, you will discover the first person to make a covenant was not man. It was God with Adam and Eve when He clothed them with tunics of skin. The second person to make a covenant, it was God Himself when He made a covenant with Noah. And God told Noah, He promised, no longer will I strike the earth with a curse like the flood. That's the promise that God gave Noah. And that promise is also included in the gospel. Because in Isaiah 54, God says, the sacrifice of Jesus is like the waters of Noah. When I made a promise, no longer will I be angry, no longer will I strike the earth with a curse, so have I made a promise based on the cross. So if you understand the covenant that God made with Noah, you will be in a stronger place of assurance that God is not angry with you today. How many of you sometimes you are uh, worried and anxious that God is angry with you? Can I see your hands? Let's be honest. Come on, lift up your hands. 
So what that means is that it's a failure to understand covenant. So if you are constantly struggling with fear and worry and this belief that oh, God has left me and uh, nothing is happening in my life, nothing is happening in my life and uh, 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 something wrong is going to happen to me because I have not been good. All of those thoughts and feelings, it means this. You have not understood covenant and you need to be established in covenant because we are all a product of the covenant. The covenant is the source of our faith. In fact, the covenant is the source of your life, your job, your provision, your healing, your blessings. It all comes from the covenant. So in order to be rooted deeper in faith, you must understand covenant. We must go deeper. 10 feet water is not good enough. 20 feet water is not good enough. We must bore well our faith and go 400 feet and find virgin water. Even when it's dry and everyone is looking for water, you are at home, at peace. Because you just have to press a button and water comes. That's where your faith must be. In times of famine, you are at peace. In times of no rain, you are at peace. Because your faith is in the covenant. Can you say amen? Not in denomination, not in church activities, but the covenant. Can you say hallelujah? Who is the third person to make a covenant? God with Abraham. It's God himself. First, second, third person to make a covenant is God. Which means this concept is divine. If you don't understand covenant, you don't understand the mind of God. And you miss a part of God's essence. So the entire Bible is about two covenants. Yes, there are many covenants in the Bible. But for the sake of our understanding, two covenants. Old Testament and New Testament. We use the word testament. Do you know that the word testament is not an English word literally? How many of you know the meaning of testament? Can I see your hands? See, many times we just use the Bible without even knowing what testament means. Testament comes from a Latin word called testamentum. And that word testamentum simply means a will. A will is a legal document. Now the word testamentum is very similar to the Greek word for covenant called diateke, which simply means the last will or testament. So a covenant is literally a legal document that was signed at the death of God Himself and comes into force when Jesus died. That's what a covenant means. So we have the old covenant and the new covenant. So the Bible is really a book about covenants, about a God who made covenants with men. And He kept those covenants. He kept on making covenants with Noah, with Adam and Eve, then with Abraham, then He made covenant with Israel. Then he made a covenant with David. And one of the promises that he gave to David was, your seed, your, your, your heir will sit on the throne of David forever. And that was fulfilled in Christ because Jesus Christ comes from the tribe of Judah, not from the Levites. That means Jesus comes from David's line. Jesus is directly from David's line. So that was fulfilled. Why? Because of the covenant. Everyone say covenant. Now what my purpose is, is to build in all of us a covenant consciousness and a covenant faith that we become a covenant people. Covenant people means a people who keep the word, a people who build their lives on the word of God. Not just on feelings and emotions, but on the word. And we bring the word, we practice the word. We become a covenant people. Let me tell you this. For any significant produce out of your life, it's going to take covenant mentality. So God made covenants and then with all believers through Jesus Christ. So the Bible is about a God who keeps on making covenants and keeping those covenants. Do you know that the blessings today you enjoy, forgiveness of sins. How many of you are forgiven of your sins? Can I see your hands? How many of you have peace in your heart? Can I see your hands? How many of you have received healing in your body in the past? Can I see your hands? Do you know that all of these blessings come from the covenant? They are rooted in covenant. It's not because one day God had a good mood and said, okay, today Nagaland, let me throw some healing. No, it's not dependent on God's mood. It's not dependent on your behavior. There's a deeper root and it's called covenant. A binding agreement that God has entered into. Covenant consciousness. This is what Andrew Murray said. Andrew Murray was a very well-known theologian in the last century. 
And he was motivated to write this because he saw that the understanding of covenant was disappearing in the church. And today, if you will go to most traditional, denominational, well-established churches, this understanding is gone. But you cannot understand the Bible without understanding covenant. And this is what he said. One of the words of scripture which has almost gone out of fashion is the word covenant. There was a time when it was the keynote of theology. It was the main truth of theology. Today, most theologians don't even believe in this. They don't even understand this. And the Christian life of strong men and holy men was based on this. It made mighty men to whom God and His promise and power were wonderfully real. That means your belief in this, it will make you a strong and a mighty man of God for whom the promises are real. Every day in the morning, you will get up with this strong belief. I am in a covenant with God. God's blessing is on my life. God is with me. He cannot leave me. You will wake up with that faith. And even today, it will be found to bring strength and purpose to those who will take the trouble to bring all their life under the control of the inspiring assurance that they are living in a covenant with God who has sworn faithfully to fulfill in them every promise He has given. Do you know that you are in a covenant today? That you don't even know? Now, we Tangas, we know Article 371a. My gosh, even if you have one square feet of land, no one can touch that one square feet of land. Article 371 NATO, KMC, DMC, no one can touch. No one can tell you what to do with your nala also. When it rains, you will open up your drain. Why? Article 371A. Right? I think most of us know only Article 371A in the Indian Constitution. We don't even know the others. Yes or no? Because it's written there for us. And that has given us confidence. It has given us boldness even in our engagement with the center. And the center also cannot go beyond this. They cannot go under this. They cannot go above this. They cannot go behind this article because it's in the constitution. So when you understand that your relationship with God is not based on your good behavior, it's not based on God's good mood, it is based on something deeper called covenant, which is stronger than any national constitution. Stronger than the Indian constitution, stronger than the American constitution is the covenant that God has made with us. It will make you a strong man. But it's up to you to believe or not. Genesis chapter 15. This is one of the most important chapters in the Bible, which you never heard of before. All right, so we're going to talk about this. Understand this. Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Joshua, David, Paul, all of them had covenant consciousness. Covenant consciousness. It was the language. It was the belief. Do you know that when, when David came to Goliath, and Goliath, nine feet tall, was saying, I'm going to kill you, I'm going to throw you. David, young little boy, says, who is this uncircumcised? Ah, he used the word uncircumcised. That is covenant language. David was saying, I'm circumcised. You are uncircumcised. If I'm circumcised, I have a covenant with God. You don't. That means I can take you. You are 10 feet, 20 feet, doesn't matter. I'm 5 feet, I can still take you because I'm in a covenant with God. God will fight for me. That was David's mentality. Now, God had a covenant with the whole of Israel, including King Saul. But only one little boy had covenant consciousness covenant language. The others were all afraid. You know why? Maybe one reason was David was in the wilderness by himself without listening to all the gossip and the negative talk in the camp. Sometimes when you're with too many people, everyone speak negatively, it doesn't work. So sometimes it's good that you go alone and be in the prayer house. Be with God. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. Okay. Genesis chapter 15. One of the most important chapters in the Bible. Because here you will discover the details of the Abrahamic covenant. And why is it so important? Because in the New Testament, Paul and Peter uses the Abrahamic covenant as the source of the gospel. So if you don't understand this, you will not understand Good Friday. This is very important. Now here you will see also many firsts. The first use of the phrase, the word of the Lord came. The first time God says, fear not to anyone is here. 
The first time God calls himself a shield, a protector, is found here. And the first time somebody believed in God and God said, you are righteous, is found in this chapter. And all of this is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. All right? So let's look at Genesis chapter 15, verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham. So the obvious question that we should ask is, after what things? Because this all, there was no chapter and verse in the Bible when it was written. It was added by the translator. So after these things means what? Go back to Genesis chapter 14. What happened in Genesis chapter 14? Abraham, with 318 servants, he defeated the army of four kings, brought back all the goods, his nephew Lot. And then when the king of Sodom came and said, I'm going to bless you, Abraham said, I don't need your blessing. God has blessed me. I don't need your wealth. He gave time to Melchizedek. So he displeased five kings. And those kings were not dead. Their armies were still there. They were just defeated in battle. So obviously, Abraham is thinking, they may come and attack me. Maybe his heart is filled with some insecurity. So here, God comes to him in a vision and says, Do not be afraid. Fear not. I am your shield. God did not say, I'll protect you. God said, I am your protector. I'm your shield. Your exceedingly great reward. So two, one, I'm your protector, I'm your reward. Your reward, your protector means for the present time, whatever you're going to. Your reward is for the future. I'm your reward means I am the guarantee of your future. Whatever will come in your future, I'm going to be the one who is bringing that forth. Amen. Verse two, what does Abraham say? But Abraham said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. So Abraham is still having doubts. God said, I'm going to make you a mighty nation, Genesis 12, right? I'm going to make many nations out of you. I'm going to bless you. You will be a blessing. All the nations of the world will be blessed through you. And Abraham is filled with the hope. But the problem with him is that he does not have any child, no son. And he's filled with doubts. But how is this going to be God? Because the heir of my house is going to be my servant. Then Abraham said, look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. So God shows him all the stars. In those days, there were no pollution. So that means there were millions of stars. It was bright. Abraham saw all the stars. Do you know that God speaks to us in pictures a lot? So he saw all the stars. And God said, that's how your descendants are going to be. So that was a promise. So Abraham responded. Look at verse 6. And this is how you need to respond to all the time. And he believed in the Lord. He trusted in the Lord. And he, God, accounted it to him. That means God Regarded him, God gave him the gift of righteousness. Now, this is very important because this is the first time in the Bible of all the millions of people that were living in that time, Abraham is the first one that God said, you are righteous. And Abraham simply believed in the promise that God gave him. Your descendants will be like the stars. Abraham did not even know the name of Jesus. Abraham did not even understand redemption, death, burial, resurrection. But when Abraham believed in a glimpse of the gospel that would come through Jesus, even though he did not have the full picture, God accounted it to Abraham as salvation. How many of you have had a question this? How are people in the Old Testament saved? Well, in the New Testament, you are saved because you believe in Jesus, right? Yes or no? How are the people in the Old Testament saved? Same, because they believe in Jesus. Oh, but Jesus did not die yet. Yes, but Jesus' death was already communicated to Israel through the animal sacrifices and the covenant of Abraham and the law. So when they believed in it, it's the same gospel that we believe with greater clarity today. It's the first time somebody believed in God and God says, you are righteous. That is the gospel which is the same thing God is expecting from you today. Your part in the covenant is simply to believe like Abraham. Verse 7, Then he said to him, God said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans, somewhere in Iraq, to give you this land to inherit it. Verse 8, Abraham still has many questions. Lord, how shall I know that I will inherit it? Lord, I, yeah, 
I believe, I know the stars, you have blessed me, we have killed so many people, we have become wealthy, but Lord, you have given me all these wonderful promises, but how do I know? Right? Like the wife would say, how do I know you love me until I see the rock? Right? So guys, save up for the rock. How do I know? So here, God's response is very amazing. And it's very strange also. What does God say? So God says to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old cow, female cow. Bring me a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. What is happening here? So strange. But look at what Abraham does. Verse 10. He brought all this to God, and Abraham did not wait for God to give further instructions. He just Guru go and he cut them in two. Down the middle. Down the middle means not here. Here. Down the middle. He cut the cow down the middle. He cut the ram and the sheep down the middle, not the birds. Okay? Placed each piece opposite the other. And he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. How did Abraham know what to do? Do you want to know? Yes, because this is covenant language. It was practiced in ancient times. You study ancient Sumerian texts. This ritual is in those texts. Ancient culture between kings and between important men, they practice this. That every time you enter into a covenant with someone, you take an animal and you cut down the two and you place it on the ground, blood flowing, and they make oaths to one another. So this is covenant language. So when God tells Abraham, because Abraham's like, how do I know? How do I know? How do I know? How do I know? God says, bring me a three-year-old heifer. Bring me a three-year-old female goat. Bring me a three-year-old ram. Abraham knows immediately. Wow, God is going to enter into a covenant with me. God is going to bind himself to me. This is covenant language. And so he knows exactly what to do. Even in Jeremiah, we let you look at it, 34, this is mentioned. That in a covenant, you walk through the pieces. It's called the walk of that. There you see the animals laying there and the blood flowing. So what happens? Like for example, let's say, this is the two pieces of animal, all right? One cow became two, blood is here. So in a covenant, two parties, all right? Quickly, Achebe, come. So the two parties, we will walk around the pieces in a figure eight. Sometimes that's in it. So we'll walk around. Just try to walk around. Okay. We'll walk around the pieces in the figure eight. And then here, you walk around that place. And then we'll come to the middle. And then we will face each other. And we will make the, sw the swearing. I will say what I have to say. He will say what I have to say. The consequences. Consequences means, if I don't keep this covenant, may I be like this dead animal. May the same happen to me. So they speak blessings and curse. Like Abimelech and Abraham. You also see that King Hiram and Solomon entered into a covenant, a treaty, and they began to give goods to one another. Even today, when China and India enter into an agreement, they give benefits to one another. So that's what it means. Today you just break it, but in those days you cannot. So now, the two come into the middle. So it has to be two. A covenant cannot be made just by one person. It has to be two persons of equal status. Because if he is a king and I have nothing, I cannot enter into a covenant with him. Because I have to bring my own benefits to the covenant. He has to bring his benefits. I have to say, all my soldiers will fight for you. And you will say, all my soldiers will fight for you. Your enemy is my enemy. Your friends are my friends. Every time you have a problem, you call for me. And every time I have a problem, I'll call for you. So we are there for one another. You are wet for life. And then you will take a covenant meal of, uh, of wine, bread, and then other things that are there which we will talk about later. So that's what happens in this ancient covenant ritual. In ancient texts, you will find it. Thank you. All right. So that's what a covenant ritual is. And this is what God was entering into with Abraham. Now, God and Abraham is now supposed to enter into a covenant. Look at verse 12. What do the vultures represent? The vultures represent Satan coming to distract and steal this covenant, okay? 
Now, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham, and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said to Abraham, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them, and they will afflict them for hundred years. So that's a glimpse of the future. That's the nation of Israel in Egypt, and then the deliverance from Egypt and the entrance into the promised land. Also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. Afterward, they, will, they shall come out with great possessions. Now as far as you go, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Okay, so God and Abraham were supposed to enter into a covenant, but something is wrong here. Abraham goes to sleep, and he's having a vision. God is speaking to him about the future. And even this future is the gospel. Just as Israelites were brought out of Egypt, we are brought out of the world into our promised land. Are you with me? Now something very strange is beginning to happen here. Look at verse 17. And it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark, that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. Smoking oven, burning torch. Smoking oven, burning torch. What's an oven? An oven is a place where there are many sticks and there's a huge bonfire. What's a burning torch? A burning torch is a piece from the smoking oven. And they were passing through the pieces. I told you in a covenant, two parties must pass through the pieces. All right? So God was supposed to enter into a covenant with Abraham. But something is wrong. Abraham, our father, was sleeping. How lazy. In the most important part of his life, boom. He's gone. But it was not because he was sleepy. God put him to sleep. You know why? Because God did not want Abraham in the covenant. You know why? Because Abraham would have messed up the covenant. You know why? Because, understand this, a covenant can only be between two equals. Abraham, Abimelech. David, Jonathan. Solomon, King Hiram. God, A Abraham, no. Right? God, Abraham. No. Why is because the party have to be able to fulfill the covenant. Can God keep his promise? Can Abraham keep? Cannot. He's imperfect. He's a man of sin. So Abraham cannot keep the terms of the covenant. So God had to do something to protect Abraham. And the seed that is coming after Abraham, which is us. What is happening here is this. The blazing torch and the smoking oven. What does that symbolize? Are you ready for the big revelation? The blazing torch is God and the smoking oven is God. God is entering into a covenant with God. And I'll prove this to you even from the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 6 where the Bible says because God could not swear by anyone this because there's no one bigger than him. He swore by himself. God is swearing by himself here. Because he cannot let Abraham swear. Abraham will fail. Like it was proven by the Israelites. They failed the part of the covenant. Are you with me? So what is this? This is called, are you ready? This is a pure act of grace. God is representing Abraham in this covenant. And God is declaring, I will be the one that will uphold the covenant. In other words, God is saying, I will take the responsibility, even of Abraham, I will take the responsibility to fulfill the covenant promises. You know why? Because he knows Abraham cannot. There is no stronger illustration about God's promise to Abraham, which will be fulfilled, which includes Genesis chapter 12. When he says in verse 2, I will make you a great nation. Ah, oh, you need to get excited. You know why? Because this promise is also to us, to Faith Harvest Church also. And that's why from September, we are going to become a great nation. It's the beginning of new things. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. This is God's promise to Abraham. Now, it has been sealed in this blood sacrifice. Which means there is no greater illustration from God to Abraham and from God to us that the promise He gave to Abraham will surely 
be fulfilled not only in Abraham, but also in Abraham's seed. Do you know that when Abraham was looking at the stars, Naro's name was there? That Naro who believes. Roko's name was there. Teja's name was there. It was there. Because we are all spiritual descendants of Abraham. Can you say amen? Amen. Their life and our life is not separate, yo. Their Bible life, we are to their life. It's the same life. It's the same God. It's the same covenant. See, God was giving a sign that this is an unconditional covenant. Unconditional means it's God's responsibility. And His promise in Genesis chapter 12 is as sure for us today as God is alive today. Because the force of the covenant is the life of God. Now, if we quickly jump to Luke chapter 22, verse 20, we come to the New Testament. And this is where we see the picture of Genesis chapter 15. In the same way, Jesus took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood, which was shown to us in Genesis chapter 15. Because it was not God and Abraham. Because God put Abraham to sleep and God put Jesus representing Abraham. Abraham because in the future Jesus will come as man as God and as man so as man he could represent Abraham he could represent all of us all of humanity Jesus could represent because he is man amen so Jesus could represent all of humanity in this covenant but at the same time, he could enter into a covenant with God because he is God. And he can keep the terms of the covenant. So the smoking oven and the burning torch is God and Jesus. And Jesus comes many thousands of years in the future and he says, this is the new covenant in my blood. Because in every covenant, there is a cutting, a shedding. And Jesus is declaring that his death will be the new covenant on the basis of his blood and his body the terms of God's new eternal grace on God's responsibility to keep his word that he who has begun a good thing in you will surely bring it to pass so today for you and me in Christ God is in a covenant with you forget US government God is in a covenant with you it's like the U.S. government and Sean Kikon enter into a covenant. And the U.S. government says, we will supply all your needs. How amazing would that be, right? If that happened, will you ever lose your sleep for your future anymore? Yes or no? No. The most powerful nation in the world is in a covenant with you. But of course, that will not happen. But better than that is God. God is in a covenant with you. He will keep His promises. He initiated by sending His own Son. Now what is our part? Your part is to believe. No part is not to be lazy. Your part is to believe. Believe means no complaint. Don't doubt. Believe. Believe means I will do my part. I will walk with God. I will shun evil. I will give my tithes, my offering. I will be a man of my word. That's your part. And even if you should fail there, God's grace covers it. That means don't give up. Keep on walking. Because it is dependent on the finished work of Christ. Abraham was sleeping. That means he only received. You also rest in your heart. Do what is necessary. Pray. Praise the Lord. Be in faith. Come, I pray. This is my promise. And this is your faith. But what do you do? You let go of the handshake. God is still there. You walk away. Go walk away. Turn around. So that's what you do. Come back, come back again. Come back. Don't give up. Come on. Again, you, yes, you. Believe in the covenant, but what do you do again? My handshake is firm, but your handshake is very limp. And then you walk away again. But God's hand is always there. So it's your belief in the covenant that is very important. But you cannot believe in the covenant until you are sure and you are convinced that God is sincere. How sincere can God be than at the death of His own son? If God showed Abraham Hey, I'm serious, man. So God said, Are you? 
then you are convinced. Right? So that's what God is saying to you. Are they? The cross is God's are to you. And you still don't believe because it's only here. I don't see it, Pastor. I don't touch it, Pastor. You don't need, you just have to believe and be convinced. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. You are in this covenant and I'll prove it to you from the Bible. So that from today, when you've come back covenant-less, you go out covenant man. Covenant is sure, it's eternal, it's timeless. It cannot be broken because God cannot undo His word. Hebrews chapter 6, look at verse 13 to 20. For when God made the promise to Abraham, in fact, a covenant is stronger than a promise. Don't think of this word promise as, you know, Korean movie, Yakso. It's, it's not that kind of promise. It's, it's a covenant, a covenant, all right? He could swear by no one greater. We swear by our mothers. He could swear by no one greater. He swore by himself, which means, remember the smoking oven and the flaming torch. God swore by himself, saying, surely, 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 surely. In the covenant, there is no doubt. That means there is no doubt in your life. Don't define your life by what you are going through. Define your life by the covenant. You must believe in it. Surely, blessing, I will bless you. God he says, I will, I will. He took the responsibility and multiplying, I will multiply you. That was not only said to Abraham, but also to all the stars that are Abraham's descendants. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men indeed swear by the greater and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Thus God determining. Look at that. God was determined. God was determined. God's determination. Can you think about that? God is determined to show, to show to us the heirs of promise. Paul here is talking about us. The more abundantly to the heirs of promise. We are the heirs of this promise. We inherit this promise that God gave Abraham. Heirs of promise, the immutability means the unchanging nature of his counsel. Confirmed it by and of God, that by two unchangeable things, what is that? The covenant cannot be changed. Number two, God's nature, He cannot lie. In which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation. Strong consolation means comfort. Comfort in your heart. Do you have no rent to pay? Have strong comfort. You are sick? Have strong comfort. You're going through loss. You're going through struggle. You're going through famine. Have strong comfort in your heart. And comfort in what? This promise. What promise? I will bless you. You have to believe that word. Can God lie? God has said, now it's up to you to believe. Which means you have to say, God said, I will bless Sean. That means, I am blessed. Don't look for physical signs. The word is the sign. The word is the sign. The word is the sign. That this is not the sign. I'm sorry, I didn't mean wallet also. This is not the sign. This is not the sign. The sign that I am blessed is the word, the promise. The promise is enough. That we might have strong consolation who have fled. We are fleeing from fear. We are fleeing from poverty. We are fleeing from anxiety. We are fleeing from the world. Fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope that is set before us. Amen. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul. Covenant consciousness is always having hope for the future. If Elon Musk came to you today and said, I really like you. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to be your provider, Jehovah Jireh. I'm going to be your Jehovah Rapha, your healer. I'm going to be your Jehovah Sitkenu, righteousness. I'm going to be your Jehovah Shama. If Elon Musk said that to you, guess what's going to happen to you? You're going to float in the air. <sighs> right? Because now you know. Tomorrow, day after, 50 years down the road, Elon Musk's billions are behind me. It has given you strong hope. So if you have this faith in this promise, the Bible says you will have hope that is before you, not hope past, hope before you. Hope is always for the future. Hope always in front of you. Hope always in front of you. Hope always in front of you. What hope? You are a blessing. You are blessed. If you see yourself today as poor, the hope before you is that you are not poor. If you see yourself today as weak, the hope before you is you are strong. If you see yourself today as sick, the hope before you is you are healthy. Don't reverse it. 
Don't see yourself sick, poor, weak, broken in the future. That is Genesis chapter 15 here in Hebrews. Galatians chapter 3, look at verse 6. Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Verse 7. Therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. Hallelujah. How many of you have faith in Jesus? Can I see your hands? You are sons of Abraham. Isn't that amazing? You are sons of Abraham. That means you have the same faith as Abraham. So now look at verse 29. And if you are Christ, how many of you belong to Christ? Can I see your hands? Two hands, three hands, four hands, whatever. If you are Christ, then you are. Not you will be in the future. You are. You are right now. You are. Present tense reality. You are Abraham's. 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 Abraham's seed. And. 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 Heirs. Heirs of what? This covenant. Heirs of this covenant. What covenant? I will bless you. And you will be a blessing. The future that you're going to have, like Abraham left everything, came out and he went with God. And God brought out of his faith servants and camels and herds and nations. It brought out of his life. In the same way, God wants to bring out of your life. Today you may be broke. Today you may be what they call backward tribe. Today you may be an orphan. Today you may have nothing. It doesn't matter. If you will just believe in God and believe in this covenant, not only I believe in God. Yeah, I believe in God. You believe in God. I believe in God. I believe in God. Not that kind of believe in God. I'm talking about covenant faith. That even though I have nothing, God has promised to a father, I'm believing in you. Now, Lord, show me what I need to do. And that blessing is not for yourself, not for your selfish self. It's to be a blessing. That means today you decide, I am going to be a blessing. Even before nothing shows up in your life, because that's the part of the covenant. The part of the covenant is this, you be a blessing, I will bless you. So you have to decide, I am a blessing. I am a blessing. Lord, I, I, I commit to you today, I will be a blessing. Whatever you give me, I will give back to you. I'll give to people. Whatever you give to me, gifts, talents, abilities, I will give it away. I will not hold. I will be a distributor. I will take and give, take and give, take and give. Don't hoard. God didn't say you will be an accumulator of blessing. He said you will be a distributor. Thank you for watching this video all the way to the end. Did you know that the Bible says that blessed are those who not only hear the word, but actually do the word? There is more blessing in practicing the word than only hearing it. And I want to encourage you, therefore, to practice this word immediately. Would you also kindly comment in the comment section how you were blessed through this message? And if you have any prayer requests, feel free to text or call the numbers that are given. And there are people here that are willing to pray for you for God's blessing upon your life. And again, please like, subscribe, and share this video and you'll be doing your part in sharing this message to the world. God bless you.